Thank you. We turn now to topical questions, and our first question this afternoon is from Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the approval of the Scottish Police Authority budget in light of reports that capital funding shortfalls have left Police Scotland using patrol cars that are over a decade old. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Police Authority considered and approved its budget uh, for 2019-20 at its meeting on the 28th of March uh, 2019. The total Scottish Government funding for the SPA in 1920 is increasing by 42.3 million, meaning the annual policing budget is now over 1.2 billion. This includes significantly a 52% increase to the capital budget. In relation to its investment in fleet, Police Scotland will continue to ensure that it provides a fleet that is fit for purpose, safe, reliable, and sufficiently flexible to be responsive to the dynamic nature of policing as outlined in its fleet strategy. The Chief Constable Ian Livingston has said, and I quote, our maintenance team do an excellent job. We have over 96% of the fleet on the road. Across a multitude of demands, we're prioritising the capital budget. We've been allocated and investing in the right areas to achieve as much as we can, as quickly as we can. Liam Kerr. <coughs> I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. President Officer, it was revealed this week that 250 of Police Scotland's patrol cars are over 10 years old, and some vehicles have up to 200,000 miles on the clock. The chair of the SPF told her conference last week the fleet is, and I quote, a disgrace. So a straight question for the Cabinet Secretary. Does he think it acceptable that officers are having to apprehend criminals in vehicles held together with duct tape? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, completely and utterly crying crocodile tears from a Tory MSP that, of course, when we brought forward a capital budget increase of 52%, he and his colleagues voted against that budget. A hundred million pounds resource protection up until 2021, and Liam Kerr and his party voted against it. A hundred and twenty-five million pounds in VAT that Police Scotland had to pay, that no other force in England and Wales had to pay, and you've done hee-haw about it. So if you'll forgive me, if he spares me the crocodile tears, I'll tell him a little bit more about those figures that he quoted. Vehicles more than 10 years old, actually 268, only five of them, five of them are on, front, are on the front line. The vast majority of them are non-front line response vehicles. And when he talks about vehicles that are over 200,000 miles uh, on the clock, he says vehicles. There's one vehicle that's 200, over 200,000 miles, and that is a non-operational vehicle that's used as a training tool for armed policing. So a bit of context and maybe a lack of the crocodile tears would be much better if you supported us in the budget that's increasing capital for police as opposed to a Tory government that's taking away uh, VAT that no other force in England and Wales has to pay. Liam Kerr. I hear the Cabinet Secretary's response, but he knows full well that the Scottish Conservatives cleaned up their mess on the police and fire vat and put 25 million back into the front line each year. Look, Presiding Officer, last week the Scottish Police Authority approved their annual budget. Thanks to the SNP's cuts to the capital budget, it says repairs and maintenance of buildings will be reduced, worn out inefficient cars will not be replaced, and the force will continue to rely on several outdated and disconnected IT systems. The Cabinet Secretary frequently hides behind the operational matter defence, but he can't do it this time. The SNP have been in charge of the police service for nearly 12 years. So a straight question, Cabinet Secretary, because you struggled with the last one, surely he will agree with me that our officers deserve better than this. Cabinet better Secretary. than a Tory government that pinches 125 million off them, yeah. doesn't pinch it off police forces in England and Wales. If he's pointing at me, he should be pointing at his colleagues south of the border who have stolen that money from Police Scotland. Well, let's just take the Tories' budget plan. They would have taken 575 million out of Scottish budget. The police officers wouldn't be riding around in police cars, they'd be riding around in rickshaws if him and his party were frankly in charge. So there's the issue of the VAT, there's his Tory budget plans which would take 575 million uh, out uh, of policing, in fact out of uh, budgets in total. And then let me just give them a little bit of correction, a bit of context around some of these figures. The average fleet age is five years old. The average unmarked uh, police car has uh, mileage of 57,000 miles, not 200,000 miles. And the overall vehicle availability is 96.4% against a benchmark 
of 95% in the rest of the UK. So, yes, of course, budgets will be constrained, no doubt, in part, the fact of, in significant part, down to the decade of austerity imposed on us by the Conservative Party. So, instead of carping from the sidelines, crying those crocodile tears, how about he supports a budget that we've put forward uh, of a 52% capital uplift? And then, of course, we'll continue to invest in the police while his party continues to decimate the police. And we have uh, Lee MacArthur, followed by Richard Lyle. Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much. As the Liberal Democrats' Freedom of Information request uncovered, a quarter of the police uh, force's fleet has clocked up between 100,000 and 200,000 miles. Frontline officers say the fleet is not just a disgrace, but also inadequate. Recently, a f in Fife, only two of nine police vehicles was roadworthy. The lack of resources was a consistent theme in the 2015 police staff survey. That survey was supposed to be repeated in 2017. So will the Cabinet Secretary now ask the National Force to bring forward the long overdue survey to find out what staff now think about the tools that they're given? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, again, I'm not there to interfere in operational, uh, operational matters for Police Scotland. But I should say to Liam MacArthur, uh, the same context, of course, uh, applies to the question that you asked. But I would remind them, uh, although I'm having a go at the Conservatives for withholding VAT, it was uh, Sir Danny Alexander, the Treasurer at the time, of course, that made the decision to, to withhold that VAT. It would be helpful to have his support to get uh, that VAT back from the UK government. So, as I say, we'll continue to invest in the police as a £100 million resource protection uh, for the police. There's a 52% uplift in capital. And yes, where uh, Police Scotland can get that feedback uh, be it from uh, the trade unions like this, the, the police federation or indeed directly from the members then of course he is welcome to encourage police scotland uh, to do that because feedback uh, from uh, police officers uh, is of course important and i have to tell you when we gave them a 6.5 percent historic pay rise the feedback has been one to to, to, to welcome that so i always listen to police officers will continue to listen to them continue to have engagement with the Scottish Police Federation, uh, but it would be helpful if other political parties, I understand why Liam Kerr won't do it, but it would be helpful if other political parties, uh, Liberal Democrats, got on board and demanded that £125 million VAT back from the UK government. Richard Lyle to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. Just for the avoidance of doubt, could the Cabinet Secretary reiterate what percentage capital uplift there will be this year for the police in the Scottish budget? And perhaps could you again remind the Chamber which parties voted against that increase? Of course, all, all the political parties, with the exception, honourable exception, uh, of the Green uh, Party uh, voted against a budget which would have seen a 52%, we did see a 52% uh, uplift in capital, a revenue protection for Police Scotland, uh, funded a historic pay rise for police uh, officers, which is described by the Scottish Police Federation as uh, the best uplift to police officer pay in 20 years. Uh, so those political parties will have to answer for that. Of course, there is a genuine uh, uh, question here in and around the capital allocation. I'm happy to explore that. I've said that very publicly in the record that the subcommittee uh, on policing, that I'm happy to look at this question of a capital allocation. But let's not talk down the good work that the maintenance and fleet repair team at Police Scotland do, that are keeping our vehicles not just on the road, but 96% of our vehicles on the road uh, responding to emergency incidents. They should be congratulated as opposed to belittled by the other parties in this chamber. And Daniel Johnson. Thank you, presiding officer. The papers submitted to the SPA board last week uh, expose issues with the capital budget that go far beyond simply the fleet. They show a £43.1 million uh, capital allocation against a request of £99 million. They show a capital budget that is the fifth worst in the UK, despite the fact we have the second largest police force. Indeed, if you compare with the Metropolitan Police, their capital budget per officer is almost five times higher than that of Police Scotland. So has the Cabinet Secretary had discussions with senior officers who submitted these papers about their concerns about the shortfall in capital expenditure from this budget? Can I just make again the point that I've made to other political parties? I mean, he voted against a budget that gave a 52% uplift. And not only that, I mean, his colleague sitting next to him, Alex, was the only one that came with budget proposals, honourably came, the only one that engaged. And in fact, if we'd listened to Labour's plans, there would have been a 3% cut, let alone a 52% uplift uh, in Police Scotland's uh, budget. So, you know, there is a really, really, he must really reflect on, on, on his own position before coming here uh, demanding more money. When it comes to the capital question, yes, I've engaged with Police Scotland, the majority of their capital ask, a significant part of their 
ask is for DDICT, an ICT project, which is, of course, very, very important. Uh, we will look at that. We will explore that. But, of course, he would expect me that for any ICT project to interrogate that. So, yes, part of it is fleet, part of it is estate, and a significant part of it is for ICT, something I have great sympathy for, but rightly we will make sure we evaluate that uh, and, and, of course, we will come forward uh, with uh, future spending and future spending reviews. Thank you. Turn to question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to support integration joint boards with funding shortfalls. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Our budget this year provides investment of seven, uh, 711 million in social care and integration, a 29% increase over last year. Additionally, the report on the joint review of progress with integration of health and social care, which was published on the 4th of February this year, identifies a range of actions, including on integrated finances and financial planning, all of which are to be delivered by March 2020. Kezia Dugdale. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The leaders of the Edinburgh board have refused to accept their funding deal, which was due to start yesterday. They've made £11.6 million worth of cuts already, but still face a further funding black hole of £12.6 million. Board member Mike Ash said, we can't go on pretending we can deliver the services people expect with the money we have. If he's been so honest, why can't the Cabinet Secretary? Edinburgh doesn't have enough money to care for its vulnerable, does it, Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to repeat the answer I gave last time. I am being completely honest. A 29% increase over last year in this budget. Now, that is, that is against, actually, if I can just remind Ms Dugdale, a 6.8% cut in real terms from the UK government between 2010-2011 and 2019-20 to this government's budget. So, I don't accept that this government has done anything other than absolutely prioritise the health budget, including health and social care. What I require integration authorities to do is to look at how they reform the delivery of their services in order to get the best value and deliver what patient care needs. That is both the health board and the local authority. And of course, as Ms Dugdale, I'm sure, is well aware, the point of integration is to devolve those decisions to integration joint boards who should be best placed to determine what their local population needs with that significant additional funding from this government. So I do not accept the premise of her question and this government with COSLA will continue to engage with those integration joint boards in order to help them do the work that we need them to do where they have difficulties that they are facing. Kezia Dugdale. Can I say to the Cabinet Secretary that she needs to lift her head from a spreadsheet and look at exactly what's happening in the real world? Because in order to balance its books, Edinburgh is considering cutting mental health services and slashing its drug and alcohol partnership funding. On top of that, this FOI request from my office shows that there are 160 people in the city right now getting incomplete care packages, over 600 people waiting for a package to start, and a whopping 1,200 people waiting to be assessed. If Edinburgh can't afford to stand still, how on earth will 2,000 of my constituents get the help they desperately and urgently need? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Ms Dugdale that uh, <coughs> it is a bit ironic to have someone from the Labour Party suggest that I live in the real world. Trust me, I live in the real world. And it would be helpful to move away from the rhetoric and actually focus on what the, the jointly agreed plan with uh, COSLA, including all those authorities, that includes Labour-led and other authorities, has agreed with this government in order to help increase the pace and the delivery of integrated health and social care to the significant success in many parts of our country. Every single one of our IGBs needs to improve what they're doing, but COSLA and I have committed to direct action to intervene and support where that is necessary. But, but, once again, this chamber has to remember that if you want to devolve decision-making to local bodies like IJBs, you have to allow those decisions to be made and not constantly want the government to jump in and fix things because you don't like what the uh, local decisions are. We have to allow that local flexibility, but where that does not meet the overarching priorities of this government, then of course we will act to assist them to do so. 
Miles Briggs, to be followed by Emma Harper. Designing officer, this isn't about fixing things, it's about stopping them being smashed in the first place. Because across Scotland, we're seeing proposals to close care homes for alcohol and drug partnerships and primary care transformation funds, something the Cabinet Secretary says she's passionate about to drive forward GP reforms, all being raided. Now, the integration of health and social care is something we all agree with across this chamber, but this is putting that at risk. This isn't how it was meant to be. Now, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, how will SNP ministers actually look now to what is a growing financial crisis across our IJBs? She wrote off £150 million of debt for health boards. It's clear our IJBs are going to be in a similar position. What's she doing to monitor that and potentially work with IJBs to help them address this record debt? Cabinet Secretary. So, can I redirect Mr Briggs towards two things? First of all, first of all a 26% increase for the funding of health and social care integration. If you want more money for that area, you have to say where it's going to come from. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I don't want to repeat where Mr Yusuf got to, but, you know, there is a bit of brass neck going on here in terms of asking for more money and more resources into an area when the overall budget is not one that you and your colleagues supported at all. But can I redirect you? Can I redirect you to the joint re review on integration and where it got to, to the actions that were taken uh, as a consequence of that, to the evidence that Councillor Curry and I gave to the committee on which you sit, that the work that is going on with the uh, IJB finance officers and the finance director in uh, Scottish Government, the joint work that we are doing with COSLA, with those uh, IJBs, to assist their financial planning, to work their way through where they have financial difficulties. But I do not accept that there is a financial crisis. I never accept, Mr Briggs, the hyperbole that you choose to use in order to get tomorrow's newspaper headline. It's not true, and you need to deal with this matter seriously. Can I just encourage all members, it's not just the Cabinet Secretary, but all members to not use the term you. Not, don't refer to each other. Refer to all remarks through the chair and talk about the person that's talking to you in the third person. So do not see you. Otherwise, it, the debate becomes very personal. Emma Harper. Emma Harper. Thank you. I'm aware that Dumfries and Galloway Health Board manages its health budget without using a set-aside model. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether the implementation of a set-aside budget has aided integration, and can she confirm whether health boards and IJBs have discretion over its use? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, Ms Harper points to a really important part of the overall financial package uh, for health and social care integration, which includes the, what is called set-aside funding, but it also includes the significant reserves that some of our IJBs have, which are not allocated to any specific purpose. And part of the overall work that we've agreed with COSLA is to put all of that into the mix in order to ensure parity of funding across all our IJBs, but also to get the best use out of, that, of those funds. The, what is referred to as set-aside is actually a, a budget of money or an allocation of money that is for the IJB to determine the best use of it, given the, its responsibility uh, for planning and commissioning of local services. Some of that may then be used by a health board with the IJB's uh, agreement to deliver particular services, particularly around unscheduled care, which is what uh, the set-aside money is specifically targeted to cover. But it does not necessarily cover only that. But the IJB is the decision-maker in this area, and we have issued uh, clear additional guidance to uh, both our health boards and our IJBs to make sure that they understand that. And that will be part of the uh, discussions that we continue to have with IJB finance officers, but also with our health boards uh, going forward. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary wrote to the Health and Sport Committee last month to say that her expectation was that budgets for all integrated joint boards would be in place in advance of the start of the new financial year. Can she confirm that budgets for Scotland's other IGBs for 1919-20 have now been agreed and when does she expect those budgets to be made public? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so my, my understanding is that the uh, majority of budgets, I think there was uh, two uh, 
uh, outstanding. Uh, I understand that one of those uh, has now been uh, confirmed and agreed. Uh, so that is my understanding that the majority of budgets uh, for IJBs have now been agreed. There are some uh, instances where we do not believe that the uh, local authority has passed on the full amount of that additional 160 million that went from the health portfolio uh, to local authorities for integrated health and social care for additional provision in integrated health and social care. So there are one or two areas uh, where we do not believe the local authority has passed on that full amount. And so I am actually meeting Councillor Curry this afternoon. We will go through a number of areas, including uh, the overall budget and individual IJB uh, situations. Uh, that is my understanding. In terms of the publishing of those, they should be publishing those within the coming weeks, but I will endeavour to get uh, a final cut-off time and make sure that Mr Macdonald uh, is aware of that. And Alex Rowley. Line officer, I worry that the Cabinet Secretary's discussions with COSLA are failing to focus on some of the key issues. The former Cabinet Secretary for Health argued in here just a, a month or so ago that there needs to be bridging funding put in place in order that through time the, the transfer for acute into primary could actually take place. That's clearly not happening today and bed blocking is, is, is further up. Does she agree with that? And does she agree the former health secretary also talked about the Alaskan model? So, you know, there is a crisis here and it's not about who blames who. The fact is the people trying to access community care in Scotland are feeling that crisis when they do so. Cabinet secretary. So, um, Actually, that is largely what the, the set-aside money was uh, designed for, was to act uh, as, in some way as that bridging fund. And for example, the IJB in Dundee uh, used uh, set-aside money and some of their reserves to engage in a bit of a service redesign and transformation in order to ensure that sustainably, in the longer term, the services that they were planning and commissioning uh, could be delivered. So we have some IJBs who have sought to use their reserves uh, and in part the set-aside money to do precisely that, which is the point I've made before when we've discussed integration uh, of health and social care, in that across the 31 uh, partnership areas, we have some areas who are doing well in some uh, aspects of their work, others doing less well in those aspects, uh, and so on. It is a mixed picture, which is precisely why Actually, the work with COSLA is very targeted. It is targeted to look at those uh, IJBs uh, where there are uh, areas of uh, improvement that are required, either in financial planning or in the work on delayed discharge, which, uh, as it happens, the statistics published uh, today show a uh, reduction in the numbers of delayed discharge uh, over the previous month. Not good enough yet, but going in the right direction. And that is the kind of focus that we have between ourselves and COSLA, in addition to the regular work that my officials engage in directly with the chief officers and the finance officers, as well as uh, with the health boards themselves. So I think we are aware of the challenge. We are trying in that integration review and the actions from that to take specific targeted action. Uh, in addition, as Mr Rowley knows on the specific issue in Fife, that work continues to try and resolve the particular legacy deficit that that IJB started with. And so I think that we are moving in the right direction and are very focused. That's not to say that there isn't more that we can do. And we are very open to any additional measures that members may think we should take. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. We're going to turn now to a oh, point of order from Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Point of disorder. Um, apologies, presiding officer. Thank you. I, I'm very pleased that we're going to have the opportunity to debate the climate change bill at stage one this afternoon. As you'll be aware, this is an issue uh, about which many, many people across society are deeply concerned, uh, as we've seen from the rally outside Parliament, uh, where many, many people have been calling for changes uh, to strengthen the bill. They knew that they had to organise a rally outside Parliament because the rules on events inside Parliament uh, state that events and exhibitions must respect the wide range of existing channels for influencing parliamentary business by not lobbying on parliamentary business under current consideration. 
I was surprised, therefore, that members are walking up towards the chamber past a large corporate exhibition for the fossil fuel industry, an industry whose very existence is directly relevant to the climate crisis uh, which the bill exists to address. And indeed, aside from the existence uh, and indeed, aside from the existence of that industry being relevant to climate change, the material that they're uh, promoting today does include explicit discussion. A document like this one about energy transition and low carbon. Mr. Harper, I think you get to the point of order. Please. Of low carbon targets of government no, Mr. climate Mr. Harvey, policy this is a political point and now. targets. Can Mr. Harvey gets the point of the point of order. I would like to ask why the apparent double standards exist that mean that pro climate action campaigners need to organise events outside Parliament, but the fossil fuel industry, which is implicated in causing this crisis, is lobbying inside Parliament on a day we're debating the bill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Harvey. The, the, it is open to any member, any member in this chamber, to organise an event or an exhibition. These events are planned well in advance. They're, not, uh, they're covered by the events and exhibitions rules, not by the lobbying, which is a different matter altogether. And that is not a point of order for this chamber. Uh, so Mr Harvey's pointing to his... Uh, uh, further, uh, I hope it is a further point of order, not another I'm argument about the point. I am, of course, presiding officer, happy to accept your ruling that you think it's not a point of order. I would be grateful for some clarity as to how we can, how members can see this rule will be consistently applied okay. in future. That's, hasn't been today. That's not a point of order. We can deal, there are plenty of procedures to deal with these matters outside the chamber. So we're going to turn to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion 16697 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on stage one debate, Climate Change Emissions Reduction Targets Scotland Bill. Could I invite all members who wish to uh, speak or to contribute in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible?